Well, good morning, Golden Corner Church. I'm so glad to see you. As a matter of fact, I am glad to be back. And I know what some of you just thought. I, I didn't know he had been gone. <laughs> yeah, been on vacation for a few weeks, had a great time, and I'm glad to be back here today. Now, if you're visiting with us for the first time, let me tell you what I normally do right here. We normally go to a passage of the Bible, and we read it together, and we study together, and we look for how it could apply to our lives. And I'm going to do something just a little bit different this morning. Uh, I think what I'm doing this morning could be probably called more of a testimony than a sermon. But I have given it a title, and uh, which I guess we preachers are prone to do. We give everything a title. I want to call it Becoming One. All right? And I want to read one verse of Scripture to you, and then I want to share some things with you. The verse is found in the New Testament book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 31. And the Apostle Paul said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will, see it, become one. I love that. Become one flesh. Now, we're wrapping up a Thanksgiving week, and I'm trusting that you took the time this week to count your blessings and give thanks to God. Can I make an honest confession? Uh, most years during Thanksgiving week, I don't do that. You say, what? No. Nah. Most Thanksgiving weeks, I'm so busy, it just never occurs to me to stop and do that. I mean, there's hunting to be done. There's turkey and dressing and pumpkin pies to be eaten, all these family dinners to attend. And, of course, there's so much football on TV that normally by the time I drop into bed on Sunday night, the week got away from me, and I never really stopped to count my blessings and give thanks. But I tell you what I did this year. I broke that trend. And I tell you, this, year, this week, this year, this past week, multiple times, I called a timeout. And I said, okay. Everything's going to cease for just a few minutes, and I'm going to take a few moments to just recognize all the ways, as many ways as I can, that God has blessed me. I'm going to be thankful. I'm going to tell him thanks. And as I did this, Pam, I kept finding myself gravitating back to thanking God for the same thing. And I guess it would, I could better put that, I found myself thanking God for the same person. I kept thanking God for my wife. And uh, while I was on vacation, we celebrated our 41st wedding anniversary. Can you believe that? I mean, anybody can live with me 41 years. I tell you, Lynn, if nothing else, is tough. She is one tough cookie. And I, I've been blessed in a lot of ways. I'm just an incredibly blessed man, but I would have to say that at the top of the list is... The greatest blessing that God ever bestowed upon me was Lynn. I, I think she's the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. Uh, Angelina Jolie ain't got nothing on her. I was looking at her one morning this week, and, and this thought just crossed my mind. And, and if you've ever seen the two of us together, this question probably came to your mind. How did a man like that get a woman like her? I think she's absolutely stunning. And there's so much more to her than just her looks. My wife is a godly woman. And I can tell, I, listen, I live with her. I, I know her better than anybody. My wife is a godly woman. She is devoted to her family. I would say that in our extended family, she's the glue that holds us all together. And she's devoted to this church. Only God knows how many hours a week she puts into Golden Corner Church. If you've ever read the Bible, the Old Testament book of Proverbs in particular came to chapter 31. The writer writes about a woman of noble character. If you want to know who my wife is and what she's like, go read that verse. It's because I think it's a very fitting description of her. I found myself thanking God for our marriage. A marriage that lasted 41 years. 41 years. And, and against some really tough odds. Our marriage has improved every year. It gets better uh, with age. We love each other more today than we ever have. We're happier together. 
uh, this day than we ever have been. And, and during this 41 years, something miraculous and special has taken place. We've become one. Just like Paul talked about in that verse we read. I mean, the objective that God has in bringing a man and woman together, he has achieved in our lives, we've become one. You say, Ronnie, can you elaborate? What, what exactly is that? Now, I'm hoping that if you're married, it's happened to you. Because if it hasn't happened to you, it's going to be almost impossible for me to explain. But it's, it's a miracle where God takes two very different people and brings them together, merging their strengths and weaknesses so that they're better together than they ever could have been on their own. Because of this merge, Lynn and I are happier than we ever could have been Alone, we are healthier, we are stronger, we are more productive. Because of this merge or this miracle, this blending, uh, we are ex our lives are exponentially better than they ever could have been apart from one another. And if it hasn't happened for you, uh, God wants it to happen for you. And I do too. I'm going to say it just like this. Man, I want everybody here to have what Lynn and I have got. I do. But just because God wants it and just because I want it doesn't mean it's going to happen. I, I, I do, I've done a lot of weddings in my day. I don't do as many as I used to. But uh, I've been thinking about this lately. And I fear that in the ceremonies that I have officiated, I lied. I always, in the welcome go, you know, good evening and welcome to this great occasion. We're here to witness a miracle of God as He takes two people and makes them one. As though here in just moments, that's going to happen. I think I lied. And then I, I close it out by looking at the, at the groom and the bride and I go, you're no longer two independent persons. You are now, now, as though, boom, here it is. you're one. You know what I think? I think I lied. I don't think that happens at the ceremony. I think it takes more than a ceremony and more than vows and more than a preacher and more than a cake. I think, I think all that's necessary. Well, maybe the cake's not necessary, but everything else would be. I think that's the only beginning. That's the launching pad to this whole process. I think there's more to it than those things. Several years ago, Lynn and I were asked if you could attribute a lasting marriage and improving marriage, you know, to, you know, what would you attribute that to? Can you give us some kind of some practical ideas? And she and I sat down and, and wrote out 10 steps that we feel like enabled our marriage to last, steps that we've taken, that created for us a marriage that improves with age. But now we look at it and go, you know what? I think it's also God took these ten things and used them to perform the miracle of making the two of us one. You know what I want to do this morning? I want to share those ten things with you. Now, I know ten. You, I know what you're thinking. Ten. Ten. My gosh, we'll be here all day long. I bet you won't. Now, I'm really, I prayed. I prayed already. God, help me not to talk too fast. All right? So I'm going to try not to talk fast, but I'm going to, tell, I'm going to encourage you to do something. Listen fast. You got it? I want you to listen very quickly. And, uh, you know, maybe this could be a resource. And I shared this with our church several years back. And, and all week long, man, I felt like God was just hammering me going, you need to go back over this with your church. And so here are the ten steps. Step number one. You ready? Take some notes here. Uh, number one, devote yourself and your marriage to God. Uh, I married Lynn on October the 30th, 1976. I was 18 years old, just about to turn 19. And Lynn was 15. And I was listening for groans. I got some groans in the first service. I got some gasp. <gasps> you know. <laughs> so I was kind of anticipating that. Lynn was 15. After our marriage, we would have people volunteer this to us. They would say this to our face. Well, your marriage ain't never going to work. Y'all are way too young. You know what I think to myself? Who asked you, you jerk? You know what I mean? I resented it. Now, in hindsight, I see that they were right. You're going to wait a minute. How could they have been right, and yet you guys have been married 41 years? 
Well, in all honesty, about two years into our marriage, it was practically over. Lynn had had all of Ronnie that she could take. And she was about to send me packing. I was extremely immature, very irresponsible, and my world revolved around me. She had had all of that she could take. So it was just a matter of time. Let me tell you what, I was dangling by a thread. And then 27 months into our marriage, something completely unforeseen happened. I sure didn't see it coming. Nobody else saw it coming. I was saved. Milton Addis is here this morning, and he was there that day. I was saved. I accepted Christ. And a few months later, Lynn followed suit, and she accepted Christ. Now, everybody that knew us knew I desperately needed something like this. Nobody suspected Lynn. She was this good church-going girl, and we both got saved. And after we were saved, we made a decision. In light of all that God's done for us, let's devote our lives to him. Let's make him first. Let's follow him. And so we committed ourselves to learning, and, and uh, Milton can bear witness to this. Everything our church offered, we took advantage of. I mean, you heard the old saying, the doors were open at the church. We were there. I'm serious. Leon and I were there. Sunday school preaching, Sunday night, prayer meeting, revivals, whatever. We, listen, we were in. Uh, listen, we were like a sponge. We wanted to learn, and what we learned, we really tried our best to apply to our lives. And then we made another decision. Not only did we want him to be the Lord of our life, we wanted him to be the Lord of our home. We put him in charge of our household. And said, from this point on, we're going to run our decisions through you. And whatever you want us to do, that's what we're going to do. However you want it done, whenever you want You are now in charge. You say, and that helped? Yeah, let me tell you how it helped. One, it changed me. I was the weak link in our marriage. Something needed to happen in me, and it needed to happen quickly. And, and, and I tell you, as I learned the Bible, as I applied the Bible, I began to mature as a Christian, but not just as a Christian. I began to mature into a responsible adult. Well, I'll tell you, another way it helped us, it gave us somebody to mediate our disagreements. Now, maybe you don't have disagreements in your household, and if you don't, then maybe I need to take a seat and you need to come up and tell us how you're pulling this off. But even as young, even as Christians, we would have disagreements and sometimes the disagreements escalated into arguments and sometimes the arguments escalated into all-out wars. You know what we found? That in situations like that, we had someone to mediate. I can remember praying prayers like this. I'd go off and say, God, can you believe Lynn? Huh? I mean, what's wrong with her? Why? It's as plain as a nose on your face. God, why can't she see here that I'm right? You need to work on her, and she needs to come to me and admit I'm right and apologize so that we can move on. And often I've heard God say something like this. Ronnie, I hear you truth is you're wrong and you need to go make it right and you need to do what she has suggested and not what you wanted what a great thing to have somebody in the house to mediate in those situations and this really helped our marriage and I know what some of you thought you heard the topic I'm talking about some of you thought this we need this we need this. And then you heard my first step. Devote your life and your home to Christ. And you know what? You felt disappointed. You know what you're thinking? I thought he was going to talk about marriage and he's off on this spiritual stuff again. I had a buddy come to my house one night. He said, man, I, I got to talk to you. We went out in the yard and, said, and he began to confide in me that my marriage is falling apart. It's absolutely unraveling. And I said, uh, I began to quiz him. I said, what's your devotional life like? He was like, Huh? I said, what's your devotional life? How closely are you following Christ? He stopped me. He said, I didn't come here to talk about those kinds of things. I came to talk to you about my marriage. I said, oh, dude, you don't understand. Your spiritual life and your marriage are vitally connected. Guys, here's the deal. Almost every marital problem we ever encounter 
can be traced back to a spiritual problem somewhere down the line. What I'm telling you is this was foundational. If we avoid this first one, we don't devote ourselves and our home to Christ, it is highly unlikely that any of the other nine things I'm going to share with you would be any more than a Band-Aid on a terminal illness. So this is where it begins. Number two, make a lifelong commitment to each other. Now, after Lynn and I became Christians, we made a decision. We made a commitment. Our decision was, no matter what happens, divorce is not an option for us. No matter. And uh, we're going we're gonna to be together for life, which means that if, if we hurt each other, if we anger each other, if we disappoint each other, we got two options. Either work through it or live in misery. That's the way it's going to be for us. I say that with all sensitivity. I know that even in the Christian community, divorce happens. I'm so grateful that we serve a God who is capable of helping us recover from and rebuild after divorce so that in many cases, the healthiest marriages I'm aware of are remarriages. But Lynn and I made a commitment. This is it. Honey, if, if, we, if we come to hate each other, we're going to stay here and we're either going to live in misery or we're going to work through this. And i got to tell you what we found. Misery can be a powerful motivator. I will say, and let me, let me, let me say this with you. If you're newly married, you're about to get married, and this is based on 41 years of marital experience. If you haven't been there yet, you'll get here one day where the easiest thing you could do is walk away. You look back at correcting the situation and rebuilding, and it's going to be this, you know, this mountain of work, patience, time, forgiveness. And you know what you're going to say? Uh, no. I'd rather just leave and start all over somewhere. It can be the easiest route. But here's what it takes to become one. It takes time. It may take a lifetime. Now, i got to add something here, and that is this. For these two steps to work as they should, both husband and wife have to make these commitments. It can't be one and not the other. It has to be both, or this doesn't work. You got me? You know what grieves me? I forgot to say that in the first service, and I've been back there grieving over, the, over that, saying, man, I meant to say it. I'm, I'm trying to do this without notes. You say, why? I don't have any idea. It just struck me that I want to do this without notes. But I'm telling you, these first two, you got to do this together for it to really work. Now, number three, manage money wisely. I won't say much about this. First 16 years of our marriage, Lynn and I made money, spent money. We even gave money away. But on the Friday after Thanksgiving 1992, we found ourselves in a financial black hole. And I'll tell you, our financial world was caving in around us. Just from the, from the deep, dark hole we had dug for ourselves with debt. You know why? We weren't managing money. Not wisely. Out of 41 years. Well, let me put it this way. From the time that we accepted Christ and made this commitment, we're going to stay together. There was once where we seriously entertained the notion of forget that. You go your way. I'll go my way. This is beyond repair. Let's move on. Guess what, guess what the dispute was over? Money. Experts will tell you that the leading cause of divorce will be disagreements, arguments, and quarrels over money. Listen, you're thinking about getting married? You've been recently married? You've been married for 20 years. If you haven't learned how to manage money wisely, I would jump on that and I would take care of that when you're doing I tell you you're managing money wisely you're managing your relationship wisely you got that so number four is this discover and develop common interests when we were first married I, I had my hobbies I loved to fish and I actually fished a whole lot more then than I than I do now and I loved to hunt and so most of my free time was directed into my hobbies. Now, I would take Lynn out to eat or we'd go to a movie. Once a year, we would go on an annual uh, family vacation to the beach. And, and but that's kind of the way my time was allocated. Free time went toward my hobbies, and they kind of got what was, she got really kind of what was left over. Now, in the 90s, I began to fly fish, and so my fly fishing took me to some of those beautiful places in the world. I don't know how to say it other than that. I was seeing some places that were absolutely spectacular, and I would think to myself, you know, I'm casting there, I'm thinking, I wish Lynn could see this. 
And so I started taking her back. We would hike into some of these places. You know what we discovered? We discovered we have a mutual love for the outdoors. I didn't know that. And so the next thing I know, I'm spending far more time with Lynn hiking into these places and enjoying these places than I was going with my buddies fishing. And in this process, something happened in our relationship. We became best friends. So that when I had free time, I wanted to be with her. She had free time. She wanted to be with me. Let me tell you something I see in my role as pastor quite often. A couple gets married. They have their first child. And perhaps another and maybe another. And and the next thing you know, their world begins to revolve around raising the kids. That's what we do. We work together to raise these kids. Nothing wrong with that unless in this process you ignore each other. And you don't give any time and attention to each other and building and maintaining your personal relationship. Now, this is what I see so many times that when the last kid moves out, goes off to college, it's not uncommon to see that couple divorce. You know why? For 20 years or so, they didn't give any, put anything into the relationship. And one day they wake up and realize, I'm living in the house with a total stranger. Listen to me, guys. You need to discover, you need to develop, you need to invest in something that the two of you enjoy together to keep your personal relationship with one another strong. Number five, again, very practical, share the load. Man, it takes a lot to maintain a household, doesn't it? Somebody's got to go to the grocery store. Somebody's got to cook. Somebody's got to load the dishwasher and unload it. Somebody's got to change those sheets and make the beds. Do the laundry. Somebody's got to bag up that trash, get it out of here. Somebody's got to cut that grass and trim those hedges. Somebody's got to take the kids to school, pick them up afterwards, take them to soccer practice, hang out, bring them home. Is this depressing? Somebody's got to do the banking, pay the bills. There's just so much work that goes into it. And here's what we've got to do. Husbands and wives, there's so much work. We can't put most of that off on our spouse. we got to share the load. Thank you, sister. Because I'm about to meddle with the men, okay? How many men are ready for me to meddle with you? One, good, good. I, the rest of them are going, no, no, stay away, stay clear. You know, guys, this, I kind of see men operate from one of two mentalities. And one is, we kind of see ourselves as the chief breadwinner. And, and you know, my, well, what I'm supposed to do, I provide. So I work, I make a living, I, we, I, you know, I bring a paycheck home. And, and man, when I get off work, I'm done. I've done my part. Give me the tea and the remote and I'm good to go. And you know what? You ask you, why aren't you helping around the house? Well, I'm tired. What about your wife? What do you think she did from 7 to 5? You think she was in a spa somewhere? Come on, ladies, help me. We say, Honey, when you come back through to empty that dryer, would you refill my tea glass? Or we think like this. There, there's woman's work. And then there are manly chores. Honey, if you need a horse broken or a fence mended, well, you call on me. You know the problem with that? You ain't got no horse, dude. We all know that. You know what I'd recommend? Go to that back closet down the, hallway, down the hallway. There's a machine in there called a vacuum cleaner. Get that thing out, turn it on, and go to working with it. You know what? Now, ladies, I expected some amens and hallelujah. I expected more participation than that. Share the load. Can I tell you, my wife was here in the first service, so she... She, she gave me two thumbs up and affirmed that I wasn't lying here. But I'll tell you the way I want it to work in my house. And this is, this is the way I try to make it work. If anybody's going to carry a heavier load, I want it to be me. I want to carry most of the load. You say, why is that? Uh, Paul told Christian men in the book of Ephesians, 
that we're to love our wives as Christ loved the church. And here's how you know if you're doing that. You give up your life for her. So share the load. Number six, never use words as weapons. What do you mean? You never say something to your spouse to hurt them. Never. You can't call them names, ferret face, fat boy, pumpkin head, any, anything else under that? No, nothing. You can't say, th- you say, well, what if I'm mad? Still, no excuse. I, I talked to this guy one time, he, he verbally abused his family, and we were talking, and I said, dude, what, what, do, you do? what do you do? He said, well, I can't help it, I was drunk. Really? That's an, that's an excuse? You never say something to hurt your spouse. Even if you're mad, frustrated, tired, hungry, whatever reason, you don't say things. You never attack them verbally. I was talking with this other guy one time, and, and we as counseling about his marriage, marriage falling apart. And by the way, you know, some of you are thinking, is he talking about me? Listen, it was somebody who went to another church far, far away from here, okay? And he was telling me my marriage is, my wife's leaving me. And he began to tell me some of the things he had said to her. And I said, look, man, I can make this pretty dang simple. I'm going to give you one step you can do that really help your marriage. Shut up. <laughs> you can't talk to her that way. He said, well, we all do it. I said, no, we don't all do it. He said, who don't do it? I said, I don't do it. And you're going to stop doing it. Well, he didn't and he's divorced. I mean, you know what? I mean, she, she wasn't going to put up with that anymore. Guys, listen to me. If that's your habit, you like to take verbal shots at your spouse, probably hours or days later, you'll go back to them and go, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? And they're going to go, Yeah. Now, you do understand this that even when that happens, that doesn't heal the wound. Not immediately. Every barbed word creates a gaping wound. And it takes a long time for that to heal. And wherever it heals, there'll be scar tissue. And then the next time you pull that stunt and you blast them you know, with your words, and you know what it does? Pow! It reopens that wound. And you go back, I'm so sorry. You know, I, I, I didn't... Do we forget? I forget. Do you know what? Open, heal, scar, open, heal, scar, open. Next thing you know, there's a thick wall of scar tissue. And that person who's been constantly wounded by your words is going to find it near to impossible to show you any affection. I love to watch television shows about courtrooms, lawyers, that kind of thing. Maybe in another life I was supposed to have been a lawyer. I think I'd love to have been a lawyer. You ever notice that some of these court cases, the lawyer who will say something and go, I withdraw. Hey, they knew the damage had been done. And honey, when you blast your wife, you can come back a few hours and say, I withdraw. But the damage has been done. So never use words as weapons. Hey, is this pretty good stuff? Good. Number six, excuse me, number seven, value each other's differences. Lynn and I are radically different people. Uh, I'm a morning person. Man, I, I feel the best first thing in the morning. I, I, that's, man, I, I operate, I get more done in the morning. Lynn's just the opposite. She's a night owl. There have been, literally have been nights when I was getting up and past Lynn in the hallway going to bed. And I would say, good morning. She'd say, Good night. I'm talkative. I thought that would get some kind of response. Man, y'all are kind of out, y'all disengage here. I, I'm talkative. Listen, if I can't find somebody to talk to, I can talk to a fence post and be very happy. I can be happy. There have been so many nights Lynn sent me on an errand and I'd come back three hours later. And I'm trying to think of some excuse. And I walk in, she goes, found somebody to talk to, didn't you? Yeah, that's exactly right. Lynn's kind of quiet. I'm wound tight. I spent most of my life anticipating and preparing for worst case scenarios. Lynn, she's laid back. We can watch the Weather Channel and there's, in, there's rain coming in. And, and I turn to her and go, honey, have we still got the sandbags? I think we need to be stuffing sandbags and getting ready for this. It's going to be bad tonight. And then she'll say, 
I can't wait to hear the rain on the roof this night. I'm thinking, good God, woman, we're going to be dead by morning, washed away in a flash flood. We'll be lucky to have a roof. I wear my emotions on my sleeve. If I'm happy, you know it. If I'm sad, you know it. If I'm angry, you know it. Lynn is very, very reserved. I've been married to her for 41 years, and Sam, sometimes I still can't, I can't get a read. And there have been times I go, honey, you all right? She'll go, I'm probably about as excited as I've ever been. <laughs> That's good to know, because I wouldn't have known without asking. You know, when I first recognized how different we were, I made an assumption that God brought this wonderful woman into my life so that I could change her. Because if she's not like me, something's gone wrong. I remember some of those early efforts to make her a morning person. Oh, she became talkative. The problem is I couldn't share some of the things that she shared with me in mixed company. You know, when you recognize that you're, and I'm going to guess something, that your spouse is a lot different from you, here's what you need to understand. That's not a mistake. That's by design. You don't need to be frustrated with them. And I'm going to give you a piece of advice. Don't try to make them like you. Celebrate it. Value those differences. Because here's the thing. God put you together with somebody who's different from you so that when you came together, you would complement one another. So value those differences. And, and number eight, tolerate each other's imperfections. Ladies, I bet you I know what you thought about your husband when you first started dating. My God, I have met the perfect man. Mm -hmm. I have met Mr. Perfect. And then after a year of dating, you strongly suspected that you had grossly overestimated him. Probably within 24 hours of your wedding ceremony, uh, your suspicions were confirmed and you recognized, oh, he ain't perfect. Matter of fact, it probably didn't take any more than one blast of morning breath and you got it very clearly. He ain't perfect. Guys, you got it. You know, hey, first time you saw your wife without the makeup with a bad case of bed hair, you thought the same thing, didn't you? My God, what have I got myself into here? You know... Past several years, I started snoring. And so one day, Lynn said to me, she said, I came to bed last night. She said, you sounded just like a coffee maker. <laughs> now, that'll bless you, man. That'll bless you right there. Of course, I've got a repertoire. I can sound like an angry bear, a set of air brakes on a tractor trailer. I've I I got a gamut of, of noises you know, that I can make. And here's something, your spouse is not perfect. You know, you've got that down. You know what a lot of people do when they recognize my spouse is not perfect? They decide they're going to go in search of someone who is perfect. Well, good luck to you. <laughs> because I can tell you now, they're not out there. What are you supposed to do? You know what, you know what the Apostle Paul said in the book of Ephesians? He told Christian people, he said, bear with one another in love. You know why Lynn doesn't leave me even though I sound like a coffee maker or an angry bear or a set of air brakes on the truck? You know why she doesn't leave me? She loves me. She bears with my imperfections. Number nine is critical. Practice forgiveness. You are married to a human being, an imperfect human being. And so this is what that means. In spite of best efforts, there are going to be times they do the very thing they shouldn't have done. Uh, they're, going to be, they're going to do the very thing they promised they would never do. They're going to say something that they shouldn't have said. And then what do you do? I want to tell you what you shouldn't do. If you want to wreck your marriage, you want to wreck the relationship, keep score. Make a mental note. Oh, I'll remember that. You want to really wreck it? Get even. Hold a grudge. Count down the time until you can even the score. That will do it. What should you do? You forgive them, which means you let it go. And you don't keep bringing it back up, back up, back up. You let it go. You forgive them. And the last thing I would tell you is never drop your guard. You have an enemy who loves to and specializes in destroying marriages. And he wants to destroy yours. 
And you say, oh, not me and the old lady. We've been together 35 years. Yeah, he did not destroy yours. He intends to destroy yours, whether you've been married six months or 41 years. It doesn't matter. He's got an angle that he's working against your marriage right now. I promise you. He's relentless. So you can't ever come to the point where you're convinced that you're safe. My, my, my wife and I, my, my husband, we're in a safety zone. We made it. You can't ever assume that because the enemy is relentless. He'll never give up. He will always try to destroy your marriage and divide your family. He's not going to give up. So you know what you've got to do? You can never drop your guard. You've got to keep your eyes wide open. Now, if he can't destroy your marriage, I, I, I tell you what he would love. To, I tell you, he'll settle for this. Uh, just convince you guys to coexist. Just live under the same roof. Just grind it out to the grave. He's going to work hard to keep this miracle of becoming one from ever happening. Don't settle for less. Don't pull up short. Go for it. You know what I want you to do? I know there's so much more I could have shared, and there's a lot more I could have said. I know that's hard to believe as long as I've gone, but it's true. Here's the thing. If you'll start with these ten steps, if you'll practice them and you'll practice them for your life, your marriage will last. I mean, if, if husband and wife doing this together, you've got to understand, I've got to be clear on that. Your marriage will last. It'll improve with age. And you're going to be the recipient of an incredible miracle as God takes two and makes them one. I want that for you. Let's pray together. God, I guess my prayer is pretty simple. I want everybody in this room to have everything that you've ever planned to give them. I want them to experience everything you planned for them to experience. I want them to be blessed in every way that you've ever planned to bless them. Lord, some of these blessings are designed to come in the context of marriage. I got good friends, and for them, I pray that you'll send them the right mate. I got others, Lord, who recognize this morning that they have a good marriage, but it needs some fine tuning. Help them to take what they've heard and make the adjustments. God, I've got some others, Lord, here whose marriage may be in disarray. And perhaps today they've recognized some things that must change and change quickly. I pray that you'll help them, husband and wife, to work together. So that you give them the marriage that you had in mind from the beginning. Lord, help them become one. In Christ's name, amen. You're dismissed. Thank you.